how do you start your day? Um, the choice may be that no matter how you're feeling, when you're getting out of bed, you are making the intentional micro choice that you want it to be the greatest it possibly can become. And so a way, a choice that you could make is that I'm going to start out my day with the practice of gratification. I'm going to say three things that transpired in the last 24 hours that I'm grateful for, and then set your intention for that day. Stay connected to gratitude. Hit the follow button right now and join thousands of listeners tuning in each week. We're the Gratitude Seekers. Come join us. Hi, Gratitude Seeker. Welcome to a new episode of the Gratitude Podcast. Our guest from today is a keynote speaker, author, combat veteran, and host of the number one ranked alternative health podcast, Passion Struck. John R. Miles, welcome to the Gratitude Podcast. Georgian, so great to be here. I can't wait to have this inspirational talk for your audience. Definitely, my pleasure. And uh, I'm really excited about our conversation today because i think it's uh it's it's a very important topic passion in life in general and um of course we will we will be also talking about some of the um the things that keep us from from being passionate and um yeah but before we get into all of that let us know a little bit more about you, about uh, the work that you're doing. Yeah, I say that I'm a recovering senior executive. So I spent <laughs> uh, about two, uh, two decades in the business world. Um, I graduated from the Naval Academy. I spent a number of years in the Navy, and I actually got out to do something completely different. I wanted to become an FBI agent. And Literally 72 hours or so before my class was supposed to start, uh, I get a call from my dispatcher saying that Congress didn't pass the budget, and so your class was recycled. And uh, three years later, when they ended up calling me again, my life had just moved on. And um, I think at that point, I didn't really know what direction I was going to go into. Uh, I didn't have a plan B. Um, I just had that plan A. And I think this is an important message for people because oftentimes we're forced into these situations where we have to reinvent ourselves. Um, and I'm going to be talking about that as a consistent theme today is this need for consistent reinvention. But at the time, um, I had a family. I didn't know exactly what to do. So I took it upon myself to take action. Uh, and I ended up uh, reaching out to a number of different service academy graduates and I ended up with job offers to work on an assembly line for uh, Honda Motors, a tester working for WorldCom, or a position as an associate for Booz Allen. And I looked at the three opportunities, and not knowing much about the business world, I thought being a management consultant kind of gave me the best stepping stone into uh, this new world. And so... I ended up joining them and uh, spent a number of years with them, went on to Anderson Consulting, and then had another huge uh, life event happen when Enron basically completely decimated uh, Arthur Anderson in a matter of weeks, was forced to reinvent myself again. This time I pivoted into industry and spent the next uh, decade or so um, in Fortune 500 companies, culminating as a C-level in a Fortune 51 and then I pivoted my career into private equity and uh, had a great career in those. But I, all, along the way, really felt this inner calling that I was supposed to be doing something different, something where I was touching more people with my message and really taking what I had learned mentoring and coaching people for so many years uh, out to the world. And so it led me to creating what I'm doing now with Passion Struck. Amazing. Amazing. Actually, I was uh, uh, watching a, a, a clip on YouTube, I guess, but I, I don't remember exactly where I, I, I got the information. But uh, in 
that it was speaking about the fact that uh, we as a as a society actually as a as a species um, we always had to adapt and uh, it's not survival of the fittest but uh, the the survival of the most adaptive you know like the one that can um, fit in different kinds of scenarios and adapt all the time and like you like you said reinvent yourself over and over again how I'm, however many times is is necessary right yeah and it's interesting as i was doing research uh, for my book i ran across research from a gentleman named dan schwabel um, who's a partner at i think it's called future workforce and he ended up examining 1200 remarkable individuals across all disciplines and he found the one thing that they had all in common was the consistent pursuit of reinvention and i think it's mm -hmm. something that's going to be even more important in this next 15 to 20 years and it's it's crazy to me that if you look at what gallup puts out there are over 900 million people in 142 countries who don't feel fulfilled, don't feel fulfilled by what they do in life. And then you look at research that's coming out from MIT and Oxford, where they're projecting that almost half of the jobs will be automated in the next 20 years. And Google's top futurist, Thomas Frey, has said that he is predicting that 2 billion jobs are going to be automated by 2030. And you start looking at that, and it just creates this urgent need where we've got this tidal wave about ready to hit us. And I think the way that you navigate this is by leaning into your uniqueness and constantly reinventing yourself so that uh, you can adapt as the times are going to change in the future. Definitely. And they're already changing. Like in, in so many ways, we, we see... Um, I at least see in, in my city so many things that have changed in just, I don't know, uh, 10 years or so since, uh, since I've been here. And it's, it's amazing to, to see the, the rate at, uh, at which everything is, is happening in the world. And like you just said, yeah, we, we need to, to reinvent ourselves, to adapt and, uh, yeah, to, to find a way of uh, overcoming this idea that this is how I am and uh, it's not something that can be changed or this is what I know and it's everything that I know and I could possibly know. And uh, yeah, I think it's... Uh, and it's also a time of, of great opportunity from, from this point of view, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so... Um, one one of the things that uh, that you talk about that is uh, related to this, and I believe it, it leads to us being able to to reinvent ourselves, is the transform transformative power of micro choices. Can you elaborate a little bit on this? Yeah, I think this is one of the most core concepts that people need to understand. And this is really a core of what I have talked to with every one of the behavior scientists that have been on my program. Um, I think we don't, we underestimate the power of choice in our lives. And to put it s simple, most of us make the same choices every day. We choose to behave the same when we get home. We, we have the same routine. We commute the same way every single day to work. We go to the same grocery store, or the same Petro station. And these choices perpetuate the life that we end up living. And I think so many of us today are living what I call a pinball life we often hear people describe it as an autopilot life, but I feel when you're on autopilot, at least you have direction. You might be kind of going through the motions, but I think so many of us today are living it more like a pinball where not only we're just going through the motions, but the motions really amount to us bouncing off different things in our life. 
we let distractions take us away from the lives that we aspire to be. And it's all these external stimuli that are causing us to be further and further from becoming our authentic selves. And so the power of micro choices is in the 60 to 90,000 thoughts and decisions that we make on a daily basis. If you are very intentional about aligning your actions with your aspirations, you end up starting to make choices throughout your day that start aligning to the dreams that you have of becoming your ideal self. And it's those micro choices that either end up taking you, as I like to call it, to the tsunami of greatness, or if we're making micro choices that aren't perpetuating that, it leads you into the valley of despair. And I think a great way to look at this is Cornell psychologist uh, Thomas Gilovich did some incredible research in 2018 where he interviewed thousands of individuals about their biggest regret. And 76% of them came back with the same one. It was not pursuing their ideal self. And it's the same thing that Bronnie Ware found as she examined hundreds of patients in palliative care, that it's not the mistakes that we make in life, but it's the should haves or would haves that we fear the most. And micro choices are so critical to creating that life in the direction that we want it to go. Good. So what is a, a micro choice? So give us some examples of micro choices that we do we uh, we make every day and uh, where different ones can lead us so a simple micro choice may be how do you start your day um, the choice may be that no matter how you're feeling when you're getting out of bed you are making the intentional micro choice that you want it to be the greatest it possibly can become and so a way, a choice that you could make is that I'm going to start out my day with the practice of gratification. I'm going to say three things that transpired in the last 24 hours that I'm grateful for, and then set your intention today for that day. I love, I say a, a personal intention every single day that today I'm going to live my day with excellence, with boundless enthusiasm and limitless integrity, true to my visions and with a heart full of love. And I think by just making that choice to start your day out that way, it frames it in a completely different way. Other micro choices get down to, you have the choice as you go out for lunch, are you gonna make the, the healthy choice to get a salad with a protein, or are you gonna make the unhealthy choice to get a burger and fries? It's the choice of at the end of your day, are you gonna sit and watch a television show, or are you gonna read a book? It's the choice of, are you going to look at your phone or are you going to spend quality time with your child who's in the room with you? It's all these little things that we don't even notice because we're doing them almost unconsciously that if you start becoming intentional about them, they start shaping how you're living your life. Definitely. That, that makes so much sense. And, um, but what I see as a challenge here is that in many cases, like you, like you said, we're on autopilot. We don't even realize that we actually have a choice. How can we get to that place to, to be able to be that self-aware, to, to realize that it's actually a choice that, uh, that we're making? Well, one of the chapters that I talk about in my book is called The Fear Confronter. And the whole aspect of that chapter is really coming to the realization that the greatest person we will ever meet in our entire life is ourself. The second thing is the greatest competitor that we will ever meet is ourselves <laughs> because we end up becoming our own visionary arsonist. We have all these aspirations and dreams that we want to accomplish but we arson the very things that we want to become. It's like setting your GPS and then not following it. it. It's like pretending you want to do a marathon or saying that you have the goal of doing a marathon, but then altering your training routine 
so that you're not doing the steps to do it, changing your diet so it's not in alignment with it, or reshifting your goals. Maybe saying, oh, I wanted to do a marathon, but maybe I can just do a half a marathon. And then a couple of months later, oh, I'll just do the 10K. But we do so many things like that in our life. And what causes it? Imposter syndrome, self-doubt, perfectionism, all these things that are driven by fears that we have of this life that we want to achieve, but we think is just beyond our reach. So to me, some of the things that you do to break that are you, you have to start getting into a self-care practice. You have to start focusing on self-awareness and really understanding your, your, yourself and what's driving you. And some something that I like to do is I like to, to sometimes journal out the goals that I have uh, for a week, a month, it could be a year. And then I start looking at the counterproductive behaviors that I have to reaching it. And for me, one of the biggest ones is procrastination. Meaning if you want to be a keynote speaker, but you're procrastinating on actually writing it, practicing it, doing the development you need to do it, well, you're just visionary, you're your own visionary arsonist to this aspiration that you want to achieve. And yet we do these things in so many areas of our life. And so the first step is to be aware of it. The second thing is to show yourself some self-compassion that you are going to make some mistakes, but you need to be compassionate about it because those are just a single step on the path to learning. Those are just two, I think, easy ways that you can start making the change, but it comes with recognizing that you're doing it in the first place and then taking some small actions to start changing the way that you're perceiving it. Yeah, definitely. That that's that's really really valuable and really useful information. Um, an another thing that I was thinking about that is helpful as well is um, and where gratitude is um, a way in which we can we can do it is to to see the progress, to appreciate the progress we already made. Uh, because when we are when we have those goals if we are um, just looking at where we are and uh, where we want to be it can be frightening like like you said and um, if we don't see the whole picture like the fact that um, we are actually closer to the goal than we realize because we did so many things in the past and we can appreciate those things uh, it's it's a whole different perspective, and uh, yeah, I think it's very important to to add that uh, appreciation as well. Yeah, and it reminds me of the work of Edward Torrey Higgins that he did on self discrepancy theory. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that or not, but what he talks about is that we've got three versions of ourself: our actual self, which is our present self. Our ought self is who we think we should be um, when you factor in obligations and other things. And our ideal self is who we could be. And I love the work that Benjamin Hardy and Dan Sullivan did on this. Um, I, the book is great. It's The Gap and the Gain. Too many of us find ourselves in the gap. We're, we have this ideal self, this future self that we aspire to be, but we're constantly measuring ourselves against something external it would be me being a podcaster and trying to compare myself to joe rogan who's been doing it for much longer than me you're constantly going to be in a state of feeling disgruntled when you're comparing yourself to that ideal where what you're talking about is the gain which is you look at this ideal self that you want your future self to be and you start looking at the incremental progress that you've made, which are the gains that you have in life. It's these myriad of micro choices that are taking you closer to that future self that you aspire to be and measuring yourself against your starting point against something instead of some external validation that you think is the measurement for you when it's not. Exactly, exactly. And uh, 
one of the other things that uh, that I love that you you talk about, and whether we realize it or not, um, we want to have the best uh, to make the best choices, the best micro choices, but we are influenced by by the people around us and they might have a good influence or a not so good influence uh you talk about the the three types of uh, human mosquitoes in in our lives can you talk a little bit about that yeah let me set this up for you so when i was uh when i was thinking about writing this chapter the way the book is organized is i found by studying over 700 uh remarkable individuals over seven and a half years, 13 different principles that they apply in their life to, to 10 exit, or as Robin Sharma would say, become part of the top 5%. And I organized the book that six of them happen to fall into mindset shifts. Six of them fall into behavior shifts. And then the rest of the book is dedicated to how you implement those in your life. But it starts out with a concept I call becoming a mission angler, which is life crafting the life you want. It then goes into this notion that we've been talking about, about being a constant brand reinventor. And then once you start reaching that point where you understand your why, you're starting to make changes to alter yourself to it. The next thing that you typically run into is forces on the outside starting to tell you why you can't achieve this change. And so as I was thinking about how to frame this, um, I love the work of Professor uh, Jonah Berger, who teaches at Wharton, and he's got a great book called Invisible Influence, which is all these things that impact our lives. And as I was thinking through that, I happened to be listening to a radio program, and the announcer was talking about what is the most dangerous animal on the planet? And he asked the audience and people who were coming back with, it's a, it's a snake or a poisonous spider or a shark. And it wasn't even remotely close. The most dangerous animal on the planet by far is the mosquito kills almost 2 million humans a year. And wow. yet these pesky things seem so benign. And it got me thinking the same goes with the human mosquitoes that are in our lives these invisible forces that sometimes have permeated our lives for decades and we just allow to exist and they feed this negativity oftentimes that we have in our life. And so as I started to go out to define these, I ended up coming up with three different categories for them. The first one is the blood sucker. And you can think of this as that person that you know who's a boundary destroyer. These people draw blood by ignoring professional or personal boundaries. They might make intrusive demands of your time. They question your decisions. They give you unsolicited advice that makes you feel undermined and disrespected. Then there's the invisible suffocators. And these are the pessimists who engage in constant complaining. They dampen the mood. They're the aunt or uncle when you go home for Christmas time who you talk about an amazing life opportunity and talk to you about all the negative repercussions that are going to come from pursuing it. And then lastly, I have the pain in the asses or the pieces of work. I call them the pitas. And these are those people in your inner circle who thrive on drama and conflict. They instigate disputes, they gossip, they create tension and discomfort in personal settings and in your business relationships. And so I think if you look at just those three examples and there are more, I think we can all, if you think through those, see people in our lives. And so what I encourage people to do then is to look at this as almost like you were shooting an archery against a target and start doing a simple exercise where maybe you pick 15 or it could be as few as 10 and pick a group of people in the most bullseye circle who are closest to you, the next group, the next group, and then start thinking about them and do any of them fit one of these human mosquitoes? And if so, it, it's you should look at it as a gift because now you know. 
now you recognize it and now it gives you the opportunity to be grateful for that and to do something about it exactly yeah i love this because like like you said it's it's something invisible it's not something that we are well aware of but it's um it has an impact it's it's something that uh, whenever we might want to go for let's say if in in the topic of the, the podcast to, to start a uh, um, uh, gratitude habit it might be that you're very excited about the fact that you are uh, stating the things that you're grateful for early in the morning and you're excited you you tell them and they say ah oh, what's that going to help you with or i don't know something something that uh, gets you down and it's harder in many cases to to keep the th this up when you when you have people that uh, that have this kind of attitude around you so yeah like you mentioned the fact that we can uh, identify them is is an amazing gift and uh, yeah i think uh, one one of the things that um, um, that i believe are great is having boundaries around these people but maybe you can tell us more of how we can manage to to keep our um focus while also being respectful uh, with these kinds of people yeah um so first thing i would tell tell you is if someone wants to do a deep dive on this um i would encourage them to read uh boundary boss by T my friend terry cole which does a fantastic job of exploring this in a whole book but three simple things that i recommend people do are first you got to identify your limits start by understanding what your own limits are such as what behaviors drain your energy it could be constant interruptions it could be negative offs office gossip it could be a friend who's two-faced and then you got to consider your emotional and mental limits like how much stress can you possibly handle before it affects your quality of life and your mental health i think understanding these nuances is absolutely crucial for defining boundaries that are specifically tailored to you your needs and how you operate and then once you've identified them you need to acknowledge to yourself that they're legitimate and that they're worth protecting. And I think this step is often overlooked and it's so essential for setting boundaries that you truly believe in and are willing to enforce. Because you've got to remember that you are a reflection of your values and your needs and they deserve to be respected. And that's something that, that we forget. We say yes to too many things instead of saying no which sometimes causes us to accept too many things in our lives that only propagate this feeling. And then the other thing I talk about is that you got to communicate clearly. Communication is the absolute key to establishing your boundaries. You need to state your limits, explain the rationale behind them, because this helps others to understand your perspective and makes it more likely that they're going to respect your boundaries and then the fourth thing i would say you've got to do is be consistent because consistency and enforcing your boundaries means setting the boundaries and more importantly sticking to them if you've communicated that you're not available let's take it for work after hours for instance but then you keep making exceptions then people are going to keep abusing that and the same thing goes with any boundary that we want to set in our life so those would be the things that I would say. So identify your limits, communicate them clearly, be consistent about them. And then I think the last thing you need to do is to practice self-care. Like I talked about at the beginning, it's recognizing your worth and giving you, giving yourself permission to prioritize your well-being. Exactly. That's, that's so powerful. And I, I love it. And I love the fact that you you talk about uh, giving yourself the the permission to do this because um, we tend to want to 
please people one way or another and we want to be uh, nice people we want to be good people and in many cases when we when we do this we actually become bitter we we become um stressed out and uh unfortunately we tend to lash out on the same kind of people that uh that we want to be uh nice with so yeah i think this is this is very powerful so another layer that i wanted to to talk about is um so we have the uh the inner layer uh, that's around self-awareness and being able to to make um, micro choices that are influenced like uh, like we talked about by the people around us but the another another layer of this is social media and uh, its influence that that it has upon us like uh, the fact that we tend to to compare our our lives with uh, with the lives of the the people we see online and uh, it's it makes it so much harder for us to be grateful for the life that we have when we see people having the a seemingly perfect life what's your perspective on this yeah i mean it's the distractions that we allow into our life are just astronomical. I was interviewing Gloria Mark, who's a professor at uh, the University of California, Irvine, and she studies attention span. And over the past 10 to 15 years, our rate at being distracted has gone from something like five to 10 minutes down to 45 seconds. And then oh. every time that you allow yourself to get distracted, it takes you so much time to get back into the task. It's something like 20 minutes to then get back into the full task of what you're doing. But I think this goes back to um, this whole concept of seeking external validation instead of seeking internal validation. And I think so many of us are so consumed in what others think that it's leading to so many people leading what I call a life of pretense. It's, it's as if we're going around and we're all in this masquerade ball, ball and we're all wearing this mask over our true identity because we're constantly comparing ourselves to other people instead of looking at the intrinsic things that are lighting the fire and the passion inside of us. And when we get that out of whack, what it ends up doing is it causes us and our reward system to be based upon seeking this constant approval from others instead of accepting ourselves, as I said, as the greatest person we will ever meet and doubling down on our unique abilities and inherent strengths. So to me, it, it's causing a huge issue that I think is ultimately leading to things like uh, the constant achievement culture that so many people feel and perfectionism and other things that are plaguing so many even of the younger generations today yeah definitely definitely and i was thinking about uh what you mentioned about procrastination um i i think it's it's very easy to to procrastinate when you have so many many distractions so many um um influences on social media on how you should be on um all kinds of ideal things that uh, are actually mostly ideal just uh, on instagram or on facebook it's just something that's created for that platform it's not something that's uh, actual real life and um yeah it's it's one of the things that influences us is exactly in those uh, micro decisions because um in those micro choices because when we uh, are interrupted we decide we tend to decide whether consciously or not to, to make the choice to to look at it instead of focusing on what we actually want and where we actually want to go. 
So how can we overcome this? Well, I, I think it starts with self-awareness. It starts with allowing yourself to show comp self-compassion to yourself that you are enough, that you don't need the approval of others to be the person that you're supposed to be. And I think, especially on social media, what ends up happening is you've got so many people on there who are showing just a side of themselves that they want the world to see. They're not showing the real person. They're not showing all the ugliness and everything else that comes with it. So if that's what you're comparing yourself to, you're comparing yourself to a flawed image of what it means to be human. And I think you need to show yourself gratitude for the things that you are accomplishing, for the progress that you are making. And when you make mistakes, which we all will make, you can't totally berate yourself for it. You've got to look at those things and really analyze how much are you perpetuating making that time and time again. If you're making it one time, that's fine. But if you found yourself drinking all the time and it's leading you to be hung over all the time, well, what are you doing about it? I mean, it's those types of things. And so to me, the way you break out of it is like I was talking about with being a visionary arsonist. The first thing you got to do is have recognition that it's actually happening. Then you got to understand once you have that recognition, what are the ramifications for that behavior that you're illustrating? And then you then need to look at how does it align with who you are inside, what your values are, what the aspirations that you are, and then look at that gap that it's creating and then start taking actions to do something about it. Well, that makes so much sense. And it's, it's so powerful because it's actually um a really great summarization of uh of what we we talked about today so yeah and th i love that so uh as we're nearing the end of our time together let let us know a little bit more about uh the book yeah so i'm i i know most of your audience is probably listening to this but i'll i'll share uh, i'm not even sure if you can see it it's getting like you can't see it Oh, there you go. Yeah. So so for those of you who can't see this, um, the book has a giant flame in the middle of it, and it starts out blue, and as the flame goes up, it changes into orange and then bright red and, and yellow. And to me, it really symbolizes our own journey where maybe we feel stuck right now and we're in this position where we are in that blue zone and we feel like all this stuff is happening to us and we're caught in this wave of of despair and burdens holding us down and what this flame is supposed to symbolize is that once you start making these different micro choices in your life that flame starts to change it starts from being that blue and it starts becoming a little bit of orange and then is that orange continues to heat up as you take more steps, it becomes red and then eventually burst out in this huge flame of potential. And to me, that's the whole thing that I'm trying to, to talk about with the book is that passion struck is not being, it's becoming the most ideal self that you can possibly become. And it's really, to me, the recipe that I have found by examining so many people who have created this in their own life. And some of the people I profile in the book are Oprah Winfrey, astronaut Wendy Lawrence, Mark Cuban, Mark Benioff, who started Salesforce, Jim McKelvey, who sta started Square. I talk about the Bono, Derek Jeter, the baseball player, Michael Jordan. Like, what do all these people have in common? It's these 12 principles that I line in the book. And the most important thing is I don't want this to be something that just sits on yourself. I didn't write it just to be read. I want it to be lived. And so that's why I show you how to implement 
what I call the psychology of progress. How do you put these principles into action in your life? And a great starting point is you can go to the Passion Struck website and I've created a quiz. It takes about 10 minutes to do. It's 20 questions and it will show you your starting point on this journey. It'll tell you what that means and then give you some immediate actions that you can take. Um, but the whole book is really born out of how do you go from being stuck wherever you are in life, whether that's you're a high achiever and you've plateaued and you're looking to go to the next level, or you're a new college graduate who's doesn't know where to take their life, or you're someone who's stuck with the burdens of living in quiet desperation. How do you break free from it? How do you lead this life that's going to carry you forward for all these changes that are going to hit us in the next 15 to 20 years to become your ideal self, which is my aspiration that I, that I would hope all your listeners can achieve in their own life. Because who wants to be that 76% of people on their deathbed who look back at all the would-haves and should-haves? I want all the people who are listening to this to say, I live the life that I wanted, that I created, and I felt like I mattered at the end of my life. Well, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. And I'm sure that our audience really resonated with that. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful vision. And I'm happy that we, we got to have this conversation and uh, helped uh, make this vision a, a reality. So thank you very much for, for being on the podcast. Uh, the pleasure was mine, and it was, it's just such an honor to be able to serve you and your community. Hey, Gratitude Seeker, thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this interview. I really appreciate it. And if you could think of one person that would also benefit from it, share it with them. It might actually be the inspiration that they need to make their day or maybe even their life much better. Thank you so much once again. This has been Georgian Benta. Don't forget to keep seeking and spreading gratitude.